the caulk related material that I want to do today also includes the, the general concept of operational semantics, which is an approach to defining the meanings of programs in explicit programming languages that have syntax. In my, my last lecture, I showed some examples of reasoning about state machines where we, we built a special purpose relation to explain the behavior of a single program. And in general, we'd like to be able to explain the meanings of whole classes of programs in particular types of syntax. And this approach, operational semantics, forms the foundation for most modern reasoning about programs, including what Amal will be talking about in her lectures on logical relations. So to set the stage for that, I need to show a generalization of a relation that we defined last time. This is the general idea of the transitive reflexive closure of a relation. And I've written it over here in standard inference rule notation. So if we have any relation, it's a binary relation over some arbitrary set A, and I'm writing the relation as a right arrow symbol to express the intuition of stepping from one state to another. We define the transitive reflexive closure by two rules. And there are actually many different sets of rules that define the same relation. This version happens to be the most convenient for the proofs that I'm doing. First, it's a reflexive relation. So any element is related to itself by the, the closure of this, this arrow. And also, if we can take one step in the original relation, and then from there, take zero or more steps to some final state, then we can compose together these, these two kinds of steps and get one big step here. So transitive reflexive closure stands for taking zero or more steps of some underlying relation. We'll apply this to notions of taking a step in the execution of a program. And it also has many other applications in math and computer science. So on screen here, I have the code for formalizing this in caulk. I should ask first, uh, in my first lecture, someone suggested a dark background might be more readable. What do people think? Is there any consensus about white or, or dark background? Yeah. Um, I don't know about the background, but one thing a few different spread might be good, especially once you start getting some fruits, is sacrificing font size for readability to keep it more, more legible. Uh-huh. Does anyone else? Yeah. OK, I'm going to put it back to the normal font size then. You, you can tell me if this is too small. OK, then I'll keep the white background, unless there's a, uh, an undercurrent of dissent that no one is revealing now that I'll learn about later. <laughs> All right, so are we happy with this, this size? A little bigger. <laughs> so let's see, I went to 200 last time, and so I'll do probably like 160 or something. Is this good? Yeah. OK. All right, so here's the, the, the Koch statement of the definition of transitive reflexive closure. It's written to be parameterized over a type, capital A, and a relation, capital R, over capital A. You know it's a relation because it's a function that returns prop. And star itself is then a relation of the same type. And by the way, this argument capital A is going to be inferred everywhere that, it's, that it appears because we can compute it from the types of the other arguments. So there's no need to write it. And I'm using the same distinction between parameters and other arguments that we saw in Agda, where some, some of the arguments to the type family appear to the, the right of the main colon here. And others appear, sorry, appear to the left. Some appear to the right. And the ones to the left stay the same across the recursion in the type definition. And the ones to the right can change throughout the recursion in the type definition. So x steps to x. If x1 goes to x2, and x2 goes to x3 with zero or more steps, then x1 goes to x3 with zero or more steps. That's what this says. Yeah? Is a implicit because you didn't give it a type? It's implicit because it's possible to infer, given the types of the others. For now, just assume Koch always makes the right choice there. It's because I set this, ar this option set implicit arguments that deduces good choices of implicitness. And so I said this is the transitive reflexive closure, but it's not immediately obvious that this is a transitive relation. Uh, luckily, we can prove that easily enough by induction on, if, if we have two star steps, we can do induction on the proof of the first one, and we can pretty easily establish that it's a transitive relation. I won't even step through the proof here. You can step through these six lines or so on your own if you'd like. <coughs> All right, so that's the 
foundation for being able to start talking about the semantics of the lambda calculus. And I'll present three different ways of defining what it means to run a program in the lambda calculus. And they're all useful in, for different reasons and different contexts, and we'll relate them to each other. So in some sense, you always get to pick the best one for the job. So here's the, the regular old lambda calculus, which we've seen before in a few different forms. There are all sorts of different programs we can write in even a language as limited as this one. So let me write out a few examples, and we'll use these to see how the different approaches to evaluation work. So the shortest closed program that we can write, closed means it contains no variables that are, that are not mentioning binders within the term itself. The shortest closed term we can write is the identity function. So this is a function that when you call it on any argument, it returns that argument. And of course, we can apply the identity function to itself. What should the result be of evaluating this expression? Yeah, we should get back to the first line again. And we can continue this highly productive exercise of <laughs> continuously duplicating terms as many times as we like. We can write all sorts of different identity functions. When we evaluate this term, it should, we are, intuitively we expect it should eventually get back to the first line. And so we want to write down a formal relation that captures what we mean when we talk about evaluation here. So the first of the three approaches that I'll present, by the way, here's the same substitution function I showed before. It's the idea of capture avoiding substitution we've seen in a number of contexts, including in the, the first week of lectures about uh, proof theory and type theory and so on. Just take my word for it. This is an appropriate definition of substitution. Here are the three terms I wrote there in Koch notation with some shorthands to make them easier to type. Here's the identity function. It's an abstraction over the variable x. And the body of the function is just variable x. We can also apply that to itself. Then we can apply the next thing to itself. And so we get up to identity 4 here, which is the third of those lines. These terms are all somehow equivalent up to evaluation. We'd like to be able to prove that. And to do that, we'll have to define what is evaluation. The first approach is so-called big step semantics. So let me write out the two rules of this judgment in the more traditional notation. Uh, I should say that in this lecture, I'm going to be sticking to what's called call by value semantics. There are a number of different ways you can handle parameter passing in a language like lambda calculus. And call by value is the version that appears in for instance, the ML family, like OCaml, and is also basically what's built into more mainstream languages like Java. And it basically means evaluate your argument to a function before passing it to the function. There are alternatives, which you see in languages like Haskell, also associated with descriptions like a lazy language that would follow a different approach, but I will ignore those for the purposes of this lecture. So the first rule, which is a really simple one of this big step semantics, we're defining a binary relation, which I'm writing as a double down arrow, which means that the program on the left terminates and results in the value on the right, or the final answer on the right. And this just says a lambda abstraction is its own final answer. It needs no further execution. And things get a little more interesting when we go to the second of the two rules. It's kind of interesting that th this is a, effectively, maybe there's some technical reason I shouldn't quite say it's a Turing complete language, but it's very close. And we can write two of these, these rules that completely determine the execution behavior that makes it Turing complete or maybe just uh, morally speaking Turing complete. So I'll explain this after I've finished writing the different premises. OK, so this is a rule for, in general, how you execute a function application. First, evaluate the expression in the function position. And it had better finish up as some sort of lambda abstraction. If not, then we're stuck. 
of course, in this language, we'll be able to prove that if a program terminates at all, it always finishes with a lambda abstraction, but that won't be true for other languages with additional features. Then we evaluate the argument to some value. Finally, we plug in that value inside the body E1 prime of this function that was returned in the first case. And then we further need to evaluate that expression. And whatever is the result of evaluating the body with the right substitution, that is the result of the overall application. So this is sort of the essence of a very strong notion of computation in two rules. Yeah? Is that first part of the contest basically just saying that E1 is a lambda abstraction? No, E1 could require further evaluation to get to be a lambda abstraction. For instance, it could be that identity applied to itself over there. OK, so this is an unambiguous idea of what it means to evaluate a program. One other, th other thing I should define, how do we know what is an illegal answer for evaluation? We can define a, a very simple relation in this case that I'll just call value. And the only values are the lambda abstraction. So we would like to be able to show that whenever big step gives us an answer, it really is a value. So we can check that Koch likes this definition. So far, so good. Uh, at this point, I guess I'll just ask you to take my word for it. This corresponds to what I've written over there, and it can be <coughs> digested separately. Uh, we can sort of test this to check that it shows us that the that big long term over there runs in this relation to the original identity function at the top line over there. And it's a kind of boring proof. Maybe I won't talk about through the details here, but we can just keep saying e constructor, which means Pick one of the two constructors of the big step relation, whichever one applies to the form of the goal, and use it. And feel free to introduce these question mark variables for arguments that we don't know about. For instance, every time we apply the application rule, we know that the first sub-expression needs to evaluate to some lambda, but we don't know which lambda. So we introduce question mark variables for the, the, the bound variable and the body of that lambda. So we, can, we don't really have to think too hard here. We just keep hitting this with the different constructors. In every case, by looking at the first argument to big step, it is completely clear which of the two rules has any hope of applying. We always pick the one that applies. Occasionally, we want to simplify to use the definition of substitution. And we keep going through that. And eventually, we establish the, the theorem, which is that the, the long version of the identity function steps in, looks like about 10 steps, to the, the short version of the identity function. All right, so then here's the value relation that I wrote over there as the last rule. It just says a value is exactly any lambda abstraction. There's that, actually, the formal defi definition of a value requires that this is a closed expression, where e, the expression e doesn't mention freely any other variables besides x. I'm going to leave out that constraint here. We can still prove enough interesting things without worrying about it. But it is helpful to show that whenever any expression steps to some result, that result really is a value. So just as a kind of sanity check on this definition, let's try to establish that fact. Any suggestions on a good way to prove this? Yeah, let's do induction on the proof of the big step relation. So because we had two rules in the definition of big step, we should have two cases in this inductive proof. And here they are. The first one of them is that so, so this corresponds to rule number one, which says an abstraction runs to itself. So we have to show this abstraction is a value. How can we do that? Yeah, we can use constructor because this follows directly from the rule written at the bottom there. In the second case, we have all these hypotheses, but this is actually a simpler goal than it looks like at first. How do we prove this? We can run assumption because we had these three premises here. And the final answer is copied out of the final premise that goes down from this premise to this answer. And we have an induction hypothesis for every premise telling us the, the answer it returns is a value. So the third induction hypothesis directly gives us the property that we're looking for here. If we had used case analysis instead of induction, if we'd used destruct instead, then this would not actually have been, uh, we, we would have gotten stuck in the proof. We need that induction hypothesis. All right, any questions about big step semantics before I go to the next kind?
All right. So the next kind, you might even be able to guess from first principles and uh, properties of the English language, that if we did big, big step, we're probably going to do small step or medium step or something. It turns out it's small step. <laughs> and small step semantics is a different style, which is applicable in more cases somehow. For instance, if you have a program that doesn't terminate, then big step semantics doesn't tell you anything about it. You can't derive any fact about it. Whereas with small step semantics, you'll still be able to conclude things about the program. And small step semantics is also often convenient for reasoning about concurrency or non-determinism or other uh, relatively more advanced kind of features in a language. And there are going to be three rules in the first version of this. And I'll also implicitly, for all these semantics, I'll stick with the call by value style, where we evaluate a function argument fully before calling the function. Oops. So the first rule here is, is kind of the most fundamental one. It tells us what to do when we are ready to actually call a function. So we have some lambda abstraction applied to a, a value. The way we run this is we substitute in the body of the lambda abstraction in the usual way. And this rule only works when this argument v is a value. Another rule says, here's how to make some progress evaluating a, an application expression. It says, if you're able to step the first of the subterms in an application, then you can sort of port that step to work inside the larger context of the application. You can take a step on the left-hand side of the application, and you can perform it, leaving alone whatever appears on the right-hand side. And there's one symmetrical rule to that one, that completes the definition, which says, you might be able to guess how this works. This one lets us take a step on the, the right-hand side of an application. Under the condition that the left-hand side is already a value. So these extra premises about certain things being values are important to define exactly what we mean by call by value execution. There, there's a nice property that this relation has. It's sort of a general property we might talk about in semantics or relations, where that property would no longer be present if we remove those extra requirements for things to be values. Any ideas what I might be thinking of? Yeah? Sure. So that there's a standard adjective to apply to a, a relation or to a semantics that works here that wouldn't work if we removed those, those value premises. Yeah. Yeah, this is a deterministic relation. For any term that could appear on the left-hand side of this arrow, there's at most one term that it could, could appear on the right-hand side. And at least if it's, I, I think this is true, uh, if the left-hand side is not a value, then there's always exactly one. And if the left-hand side is a value, then there's nowhere it can step. And so the way that works is, for instance, if I, if I left out this value requirement, that if I had an application, say, this example term right here, then we could choose whether to do an, a, a step of execution on the left side or the right side. Both of these sides are ready to have a, a so-called beta reduction using the first of the rules over there. But this rule disambiguates and tells us we couldn't possibly apply this rule first because it requires that this first sub-expression is already a value. And over there, we don't have a value. We have a function application. So this forces us to evaluate the, the, function, the, the function position first, then the argument position. And then when both are done, we can apply this rule that actually substitutes inside the body of the lambda expression that we came up with.
And here is the, the Koch code for defining this relation. It's just uh, read off from that notation in the usual way. And we can repeat the example derivation from the big long redundant identity function here to show that it gets to the simple identity function. But we're not just going to say identity four steps to identity. It will take multiple steps. And we do that using this transitive reflexive closure operator that I introduced at the start, which I called star. So we can apply the star relation where the underlying relation is small step. And this will show us that identity four gets to identity. And it's a pretty similar proof where we just keep applying different constructors. I won't go through the details here. In one case, I had to give the constructor because the E constructor guessed it must be the first application case, but actually it's the second one. Otherwise, it's just running constructor steps over and over again, picking the right ones in general, simplifying the def definition of substitution where possible. So we get to the same answer this way. All right, any questions about small step semantics before we start proving some theorems about it? OK. So one of the things we'd like to be able to prove is that small step and big step semantics are equivalent in an appropriate sense. And we can't just say that each relation is contained in the other because that doesn't work. Small step might take just one step and not finish an evaluation process, while big step always goes from start to finish in the execution of a program. So one natural way to, to phrase this connection has to do with what happens when we, we run small step zero or more times and we finish at a value. That should be equivalent to running big step. 